In our last lecture, we looked at human rights. In this lecture, we turn our attention to humanitarianism. Non-governmental humanitarian organizations have evolved into a crucial pillar of the international humanitarian architecture. Today, there's approximately 3,000 to 4,000 internationally operating NGOs. The majority of these are development-only organizations. Others are what are sometimes known as briefcase NGOs, created to respond to specific problems and often to particular funding opportunities. Once these are excluded, the number of NGOs globally is approximately 260 to 300 or so. A handful of the large and influential organizations predominate. These include CARE, uh, Catholic Relief Services, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, Oxfam, Save the Children, and World Vision. All but the U.S. base uh, Catholic Relief Services are composed of multiple national affiliates under various forms of confederation. For example, CARE International, Oxfam International, uh, Save the Children Federation, and World Vision ranges from 10 to 65 national members. Although all of these NGOs conduct programs across sectors, most occupy a specific operational niche. CARE, for example, has its niche in food delivery and logistics, Medicine Sans Frontières in health, Oxfam in water and sanitation, and Save the Children on the needs and the well-being of the children. At present day, there's a more confederated style of governance that has begun to emerge across these organizations. In part, this is reflected by the perceived need for tighter policy coherence amongst national members and the desire to increase uh, the global South's participation. The evolution of humanitarian action can be understood with, by three main historical strands or traditions. We can suggest that there's a religious, a Duntatus, and a Wilsonian tradition. The religious tradition, the oldest of the three, have evolved out of overseas missionary work. But apart from evangelical sort of organizations, most religious humanitarian agencies do not overtly preach their religious sort of aspirations. Uh, Catholic organizations such as CRS, Carita, uh, have represented some of the largest and most visible aid organizations. These organizations see their humanitarian programs as straddling the church and the secular world, combining social and religious goals. Duntatis humanitarianism is named that for Red Cross funder Henry Dunant. The oldest of today's super NGOs, the Save the Children, was created in a Duntatis sort of image at the end of the First World War. Others in this tradition include Oxfam and Médecins Sans Frontières. Duntatis organizations seek to position themselves outside of state interests. Finally, there are Wilsonian humanitarian organizations, and this is characterized by most U.S.-based NGOs. Wilsonian humanitarian sort of NGOs are named after President Woodrow Wilson, who hoped to project U.S. values and influence as a force for good in the world. The Wilsonian tradition sees a basic compatibility with humanitarian aims and U.S. foreign policy objectives. CARE is perhaps the largest and most quintessential American NGO that is in this tradition of the Wilsonian sort of NGO. CARE came into being during the Marshall Plan after World War II and began live delivering care packages to war-affected European nations. Wilsonian NGOs have a very practical operational bent, and practitioners have crossed back and forth into government positions. There is, of course, a Duntatis and Wilsonian split based on the sort of traditions uh, that these NGOs arose out of. Um, differences in approaches can be seen between the U.S. and European NGOs can concern financial structures and the giving patterns of the public, as well as divergent political histories and philosophical traditions. European NGOs tend to enjoy greater financial independence from governments. Operationally, such duntatist agencies tend to take a long-range contextual approach to crises and see advocacy as at times having more lasting importance than the actual aid operation itself. U.S. 
Style NGOs or Wilsonian NGOs are fundamentally pragmatic. They're focused on the logistical and technical task of aid and intent on maximizing efficiency within the short-term operational setting of an emergency. The European agencies that engage in advocacy tend to be deliberately confrontational, whereby their US counterparts are typically behind the scenes sort of policy advice. The tentative critique holds that US organizations only offer short-term solutions with little lasting impact. The Wilsonian counterargument has been that independence at any cost is foolhardy. Uh, it's a foolish sort of proposition, so to speak, and that the reification of humanitarian space serves agencies' ethos more than the people in need of assistance. Globally, NGOs are estimated to receive a quarter of their finances directly from government humanitarian funds, with some individual governments giving much higher proportions. For example, France gives about 40%, the United States upwards of 60%. How NGOs are financed reflects and reinforces their divergent perspectives. The major US NGOs simply cannot operate at their current level without public funding. For example, almost 50% of funding for care and Save the Children USA comes from the US government. In contrast, Oxfam USA receives 75% of its funds from private sources, and Oxfam Great Britain takes only about a quarter of its funding from the British government. Medicine Sans Frontieres maintains a 70% private to public ratio and refuses funding from governments that are belligerent in a conflict or whose neutrality is otherwise compromised. The US donor public is less easily tapped than their European counterparts. And what giving there is tends to focus on domestic causes. The bulk of charitable donations going to international causes is religiously oriented, allowing World Vision and, and CRS to sustain much lower levels of public funding than secular organizations. In fact, in the early 2000s, we did see a major effect with September 11th, which appeared to have harmed the funding of US NGOs particularly in terms of private giving, much more severely than the European counterparts. For example, in the months following 9-11, there were drastic declines in non-public funds flowing to US NGOs. Of course, we must point out that more government aid funding is flowing bilaterally through NGOs, or more precisely through a handful of the largest NGOs than ever before. The share of multilateral aid, that is the unairmarked contributions to multilateral organizations, dropped from around 31% in the late 1980s to 25% in the 1990s, and steadily earned that early 20% sort of mark in the 2000s. This trend towards more bilateral grant making coincided with a doubling of official humanitarian assistance. One implication of this trend is that many donor governments are channeling more aid through NGOs, resulting in closer relations between donors and NGOs, and the introduction of new contractual and management tools designed to regularize and formalize relations, and also greater pressure for accountability to donor-defined performance measures. European NGOs such as Médecins Sans Frontières and Oxfam are in a better position to refuse government grants when accepting them is politically awkward, and thus they can readily distance themselves from state interests. The relationship between humanitarian actors and the military has become increasingly fraught. Most NGOs at one time or another coordinated with military forces in the execution of their aid activities. In today's times, this is done with varying degrees of caution and reluctance. In fact, we do find that U.S. organizations are typically the most amenable. Agencies have not yet found a comfortable way to position themselves vis-a-vis -vis a counter-terror agenda. Some have tried to distance themselves, while others take the aid funds available to them, and the context of their provision as simply political realities that define their operational universe. The most extreme Wilsonian stance has seen some NGOs accepting their role in the military effort. This position draws the line at using humanitarian deliveries for specific political aims, 
but sees no inherent conflict between the work of humanitarian organizations and the U.S. military in, for example, Afghanistan. When it comes to the advocacy strategies of humanitarian NGOs, it is often directed at governments to affect policy change, as well as towards the public to educate and build constituencies behind certain values and ideas. As discussed at length in an advocacy uh, lecture, what we do find is that, that humanitarian NGOs do conduct advocacy through a variety of means, including lobbying, public statements, publications, press articles, editorials, uh, the mobilization of demonstrations or petition campaigns, and in international forums and government offices. We have seen an uptake in terms of advocacy and an increasing importance amongst uh, humanitarian NGOs to advocate. Um, and so what we have seen at the end of the day is, is new internal structures to generate and disseminate clearer messages. This can actually be found through groups such as the International Council of Voluntary Agencies based in Switzerland or the interaction in the United States. Through these types of groups, humanitarian NGOs have sought to unify their advocacy vis-a-vis -vis governments and international organizations. Um, and all of the major humanitarian NGOs maintain liaison and policy offices at the United Nations. In the chain security atmosphere following September 11th, some avenues of NGO advocacy has been closed off, while others have opened up. UN member nations have largely shelved the kind of low-level security issues that have been prominent in NGO lobbying, such as landmines of small arms. On the other hand, for agencies in the United States, there appears to be new opportunities to engage the traditionally introspective American public in international issues. Meanwhile, the U.S.'s administration embrace on preemptive security could be a challenge to the traditional Estonian identification with U.S. government policy. At the end of the day, by their nature, humanitarian NGOs inhabit relationships of mutual dependence. The scale of modern humanitarian emergencies and the comparatively limited capacities of humanitarian NGOs demand that they coordinate their activities with each other, with multilateral agencies, with governments, and with the media. In most emergencies, even the largest NGO is incapable of launching an effective response individually. Despite the fact that NGOs have different mandates, organizational histories, cultures and interests, epistemic and collegial links among staff members of major NGOs are strong. NGOs have greatly increased their coordination in the 2020s, in practice and in principle, covering virtually every aspect of their work. There's a new plethora of mechanisms and initiatives that have been taking place, spurred on by perceived failures in humanitarian crisis and increasing criticism of aid in general. Organizations have sought to enhance their performance and effectiveness, to strengthen their accountability and restore public trust in the humanitarian enterprise. Sections of the humanitarian NGO community, led by Oxfam and other British organizations, wish to see a tighter, more rules-based community emerge, where codes have teeth and NGOs are held to performance standards and made fully accountable for their programs. Ultimately, today's humanitarian NGOs enjoy a wide range of options as to how they want to work together and how to approach donor governments. They can choose to do so as a group, singularly, behind the scenes or in the public sort of confrontation. In the end, the epistemic networks and operational linkages between NGOs, which bind practitioners and shape the humanitarian agenda, irrespective of individual mandates, donors and governance, may hold the most potential for bridging um, sort of bridges uh, across the community's divisions. This concludes our lecture in humanitarianism. In our next lecture, our final lecture, we will be looking at the environment.